Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinami Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvishi Sasunya Vari Pastyat Yade Satarine Mancha Kalpata Rubis Jakri Pasindu Beva Chapatitanam Savane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Dvaita Gadadhar Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare <coughs> Continuing in this series of verses from the third canto, <coughs> 25th chapter and this verse uh, is very direct in describing the, quali the qualities or symptoms of a Holy person. Titik sava karunika suhidam sarvadehinam majata shatrava shanta sarva sarubhushanaha. The symptoms of a sadhu are that he is tolerant, merciful, and friendly to all living entities. He has no enemies, he is peaceful. He abides by the scriptures and his, all his characteristics are sublime. Srila Prabhupada's purport. Asadu, as described above, is a devotee of the Lord. Uh, uh, Varuna, uh, Runda? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Runda? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, how, about you reading the pur how about you reading the purport? Okay, okay, Maharaj. A sadhu as described yeah, nice, nice and clear and slow. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. A sadhu, as described above, is a devotee of the Lord. His concern, therefore, is to enlighten people in devotional service to the Lord. That is his mercy. He knows that without devotional service to the Lord, human life is spoiled. A devotee travels all over the country from door to door, preaching. Be Krishna conscious, be a devotee of Lord Krishna. Don't spoil your life in simply fulfilling your animal propensities. Human life is meant for self-realization or Krishna consciousness. These are the preachings of a sadhu. He is not satisfied with his own liberation. He always thinks about others. He is the most compassionate personality towards all the fallen souls. Therefore, one of his qualifications is karunika, great mercy to the fallen souls. While engaged in preaching work, he has to meet with so many opposing elements. And therefore, the sadhu, or a devotee of the Lord, has to be very tolerant. Someone may ill-treat him because the conditioned souls are not prepared to receive the transcendental knowledge of devotional service. They do not like it. That is their disease. The sadhu has the thankless task of impressing upon them the importance of devotional service. Sometimes devotees are personally attacked with violence. Lord Jesus Christ has crucified. Haridas Thakur was caned in 22 marketplaces. And Lord Chaitanya's principal assistant, Nityananda, was violently attacked by Jagai and Madai. But still, they were tolerant because their mission was to deliver the fallen souls. One of the qualifications of a sadhu is that he is very tolerant and is merciful to all fallen souls. He is merciful because he is the well-wisher of all living entities. He is not only a well-wisher of human society, but a well-wisher of animal society as well. It is said here, Sarva Dehi Nam, which indicates all living entities who have accepted material bodies. Not only does the human being have a material body, but other living entities such as cats and dogs also have material bodies. The devotee of the Lord is merciful to everyone, the cats, dogs, trees, etc. He treats all living entities in such a way that they can ultimately get salvation from this material entanglement. 
Shivananda Sen, one of the disciples of Lord Chaitanya, gave liberation to a dog by treating the dog transcendentally. There are many instances where a dog got salvation by association with a sadhu because a sadhu engages in the highest philanthropic activities for the benediction of all living entities. Yet, although a sadhu is not inimical towards anyone, the world is so ungrateful that even a sadhu has many enemies. What is the difference between an enemy and a friend? It is a difference in behavior. A sadhu behaves with all conditioned souls for their ultimate relief from material entanglement. Therefore, no one can be more friendly than a sadhu in relieving a conditioned soul. A sadhu is calm and he quietly and peacefully follows the principles of scripture. A sadhu means one who follows the principles of scripture and at the same time is a devotee of the Lord. One who actually follows the principles of scripture must be a devotee of God because all the Shastras instruct us to obey the orders of the personality of Godhead. Therefore, sadhu means a follower of the scriptural injunctions and a devotee of the Lord. All these characteristics are prominent in a devotee. A devotee develops all the good qualities of the demigods, whereas a non-devotee, even though academically qualified, has no actual good qualifications or good characteristics according to the standard of transcendental realization. <laughs> So here, <clears throat> both the activities, the, mon the mentality and the characteristics of a great soul or a sadhu is being described. And one thing that Srila Prabhupada clearly mentions is sadhu is, well, we can say what a sadhu is not. It's not that by some kind of dress one becomes a sadhu or by one posi one's position even within a spiritual uh, uh, society, one becomes a sadhu. The sadhu is known by qualifications, characteristics, and uh, activities. <laughs> so here, the, one of the qualifications, along with the characteristics that are mentioned here, is that one has to be a devotee of the Lord. There are many who go on in the name of sadhu and are also respected in that way as being of that category, but they are not devoted to the Lord. They are devoted to a certain lifestyle, which may give them some prestige, or maybe they have some tendency for renunciation, but they are not so compassionate to the fallen souls. Sometimes they avoid in the non-devotees because they think the non-devotees will simply pollute them and therefore they avoid it. Uh, so you might say in one sense, we could give them some credit for their characteristics and their lifestyle, but they, in the real sense of the term, the word saddle doesn't fully apply. <clears throat> because they are not engaged in devotional service. And there are many, mm -hmm. just like when Prabhupada was approached by one very respectable gentleman who Prabhupada was staying at his home. The gentleman was uh, <clears throat> nicely serving Srila Prabhupada along with his family. And he at one point said, Swamiji, you know, we have, he was referring to India, we have so many sadhus here, but we have so many problems. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, yes, that is the problem. You don't know what is a sadhu. <laughs> and Prabhupada would also say, we would hear, you could hear many times that people, Describe a sadhu by some external appearance, long flowing robes, a nice beard, smiling, and giving ashibad. 
Uh, that's not a sadhu, that's some show. Uh, a real sadhu is one who has these qualities as mentioned, tolerant, merciful. Merciful doesn't mean that simply by being a mental well-wisher, he's actually merciful in the sense that he actually tries to relieve the suffering of others. That is real mercy. It's not that we simply hold up our hand and say, Ashtibad, I give you blessings, best wishes, and don't, don't do anything else. That is not mercy. That is simply some show. Um, so mercifulness actually means to see that people are suffering due to wrong understanding of the purpose of life, and therefore trying to educate them, enlighten them, by giving both transcendental knowledge and by clarifying a lifestyle that will free them from their suffering. Friendly to all living entities, Prabhupada mentions this very interesting. It's very nice how he describes it. He said, you know, there are enemies and there are friends in life. But one is a friend is concerned about others. So one who's concerned about the welfare of others, it, goes, it also connects itself with the merciful characteristic. One who is friendly to all living entities is a, a well-wisher who wants to benefit others in some way, mostly through transcendental knowledge and directions in life. <laughs> a sadhu, someone who I try to give, become an enemy of him, just like we have the example, Gee, Lord Jesus Christ, was always praying to accept the sufferings of others so he could, so they could be relieved of his suffer, their suffering. But he wasn't appreciated for, the, for his sacrifice, nor for his words, at least by a certain class of people who were the ruling class at the time. Uh, they saw him as a threat to the established political and religious uh, status quo. Uh, for example, Jesus Christ mm, would say to them, you know, when you when they used to do their priesthood on the altar, the priests would offer a sepulcher. And uh, the sepulcher is like a cup with different holy items in it. But he, he said, your sepulcher is simply full of worms. You have nothing to offer to the Lord. <laughs> and he caused, they were using the temple for money exchanges, making money by exchanging various types of goods like that. So they turned the temple into a business. He became very strong about that. And he actually arranged for their business to get pushed away. Now they didn't appreciate that also. So he challenged the status quo. Those who go along with the status quo cannot be called sadhus. Yeah. A modern and sometimes modern day sadhus, they call themselves sadhus. They align themselves with people who are in the mode of goodness in order to propagate some some sub-religious principle in order to improve the material of one's material life, such as uh, they teach various types of techniques in order to improve your efficiency in the activities that you perform, such as learning how to be mindful when you do things, being mindful, but being mindful in material life means just being better in the wrong direction. <laughs> means going faster down to hell. That's all it really means. So they talk about mindfulness. They talk about different ways to somehow fulfill your desires so you can be more efficient in your work, more efficient in your business, more efficient in uh, re rendering uh, activities uh, on the social and political levels. And so they, these people are considered to be well-wishers of people. 
And sometimes we see so-called holy people who have connections with religious organizations also take up these same activities. Uh, they may even start a health business and become doctors in some form or another. But they're not really well-wishers of the society. They're more like businessmen in the disguise of some kind of religious person. So what goes on today is that we have a whole gamut of uh, people who play the role of well-wishers and do-gooders and also the role of sadhus. They take that word. But actually, uh, in, in playing that role, what did they do? They just uh, make some profit from it or they push people in the wrong direction or in the material direction. But when you come right down to the definition of the word sadhu, it means to cut means to cut away people's material attachment. So the word sadhu means holy person and means to cut. And therefore we find even within religious organizations, people don't like to associate too much with sadhus because they are afraid that they'll cut away or make an attempt to cut away their material attachments. A lot of time people join religious institutions in order to increase their material success to get more money. Of course, that's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. People come to Krishna consciousness to improve their material conditions with more economic uh, gain, with more ways to avoid material suffering and find material happiness. Uh, there's a whole list of why people come to religious organizations. Very few actually come for the goal of life. Sometimes we see people come for the wrong reason or for a material reason, but then after understanding why they are in the institution and the benefit of the activities given by the institution, that is devotional service, they start, they actually change their desire to become Krishna conscious. And that is why Krishna says, we welcome people from different categories, but then we have to understand that there is an education that is needed to clarify the real goal of life. So people don't stay within the realm of material desires within uh, spiritual circles. Uh, and this is very common too. Uh, people don't want to come to the platform of devotional service, which means to serve the Lord for the pleasure of the Lord without uh, thinking anything in terms of what I'm getting from it. Uh, no personal gain. That is real devotional service. So anyone who's teaching that and living that, that person is called a sadhu in the real sense of the term. Well, here we see that, uh, and Prabhupada wants to make this point clearly. He gives, he gives two very prominent examples, both with Jesus Christ and Srila Haridas Thakur, who only had the interests, the best interests of people in general as their focus in life, but they were not appreciated. They were sometimes uh, lied about, they lied, people would lie about them saying that this is, that their motivations were selfish or uh, uh, personal gain. So you find that, you know, to be in that category of being a well-wisher to others and working in that capacity, you will develop enemies because people don't want it. You know, People will either be indifferent or uh, uh, adverse, either one. I mean, there are some sincere people that who will, who, will, who will also appreciate that. But then again, as the sadhu continues his mission, many people want to stop at a certain point that uh, 
this is all I can take. I don't want to go any, I don't think it's necessary for me to give up all these other things. Uh, I can be a devotee on this level. All right, that's fine. That means you don't actually, that means you take another body or you go to another, you go to the heavenly planets when you finish your life in this world and enjoy some heavenly opulence for so many thousands of years and then again fall back down to this planet again where you where you were before you even became a devotee to take up materialistic activities again so um very few people actually want to come to the platform of uh pure devotional service and there are two kinds of pure devotees there are those who are, are purified by the process of Krishna consciousness. They are free from all material desires and they act only for the uh, benefit of, of others and for the pleasure of Krishna. That's what we know as a pure devotee. But then we have another category of pure devotee, which is interesting. And this is very important to understand is that those who have pure motivations but are not purified. And this is where we can fit in. We should try to understand that by having pure motivations, it will eventually lead us to this platform of purified consciousness. I want to be a pure devotee. My nature is pure devotional service. I understand that by becoming a pure devotee, um, I can reach perfection in life, go back home, back to Godhead. Although I still have desires for material happiness in this world, and I may still also occasionally try to fulfill those desires, um, my real goal is pure devotional service. Of course, uh, one who has that goal may still have material desires, but I have to... Uh, Correct that statement I made that they don't try to fulfill their material desires, although they know their those desires are still there. So they just don't act on them. And that's where by having pure intentions, you also develop uh, the uh, you you also move in the direction where the pure devotional service becomes uh, easily attained. And so, yeah, so we're, we're, this is an interesting verse and purport. And Srila Prabhupada mentions the qualities and activities and the, 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 the uh, characteristics of the, these devotees. And as Prabhupada mentions, these quality characteristics are not something that you have to look for. They are prominent. They are just like the sun. You don't need a lamp to see the sun. Some people say, well, I have to see the sun, so I'll go get my lamp so I can find, have enough light to see that. No, the sun is self-effulgent. It doesn't need any of it, any light outside of itself. So a sadhu also, their characteristics are prominent. Tolerance, patience, humility, pridelessness, uh, mercy to other living beings, detachment, from everything that's material. So these are the characteristics of a real sadhu and not someone which is very fashionable today to dress as a sadhu or try to act in such a way that they try to present themselves as being a holy person. Uh, sometimes you see they have some mystic power and they can speak in such a way as to control people's minds and bring people to do whatever they want them to do or believe whatever they want them to believe. And there was one person who was like that. He had this tremendous power. Uh, he had the power of, um, I forgot the name of it. It's a, it's a particular where you speak and people are completely absorbed in everything you say. Um, somebody remembers the name of that particular mystic power. And so he was, he was from Pune, a sadhu many, many decades ago. 
and uh, he had this power. And when he would give a lecture, it was complete silence. Everyone was riveted on everything he said. And so he developed a, a kind of following based on that. But at the same time, he developed a, a sense of pride because of the powers that he had developed. And then um, he was uh, boasting how he could not be affected by anything in this world. That, uh, and uh, so they wanted to make an experiment. And actually he suggested the experiment. They, he said, I can stay overnight with a beautiful girl in a hotel room and remain free from any activity. So they put him, they put him to the test. <laughs> And after the next night, the next day, he gave a lecture and said, I have found something very important that I think you all should know, that I have discovered the power of uh, sexual activity in relationship to spirituality. <laughs> so then he changed his whole platform, calling it um, holy sex. <laughs> and then he gained so many followers and he became quite well known in America. He had his own place there. He had 32 Rolls Royces. <laughs> he had so many followers. And part of the program is that people would just come up with sexual partners and there was, a, I don't forget, there was a, I don't even know, there's a kind of ritual they used to go through like that. But one of the problems his group was having is that there were too many children being born also. <laughs> so that was another problem. And then they started getting into sterilization of the ladies and it became a whole fiasco. Finally, some of his followers turned against him and uh, he was, um, is shown to be engaged in uh, fraud, uh, tax fraud with the United States government. And so they put him in jail in the United States. And then after that, they deported him back to India. And then uh, not long after that, he, uh, he departed his body in Pune. So um, yeah, so here you see so-called sadhu. Uh, so-called sadhu, because he had the power of, of, I think it's called, not Prapti City, but it's uh, Rishita, or I can't remember the particular city that it is, but it, uh, you speak and everyone believes everything you say completely. Um, there's another person like that who is very present in the world today. He has a very large follow, follow, following follower, he speaks and people just gather around to listen more and more and whatever he say they believe. But he's an atheist. <laughs> he doesn't really believe in God. He simply has the power of speech. So yeah, so um, there's a whole gamut of so-called sadhus out there. So this verse is kind of reveals what is a real sadhu friendly to all, uh, very good qualities and characteristics, merciful to others, and engaged in devotional service to the Supreme Lord. Okay, so um, this is a verse that, and purport that we can spend hours discussing because there's so many relevant points that we can learn from but we'll stop here and see if there's any comments or questions. Thank you, Maharaj, for the class. Very nice. It was, uh, devotees, if there are any questions, comments, please go ahead.
Sudah. Oh. Krishna hey. Maharaj. Oh. Ah, sorry, Mataji. Please go ahead. Please go no, ahead. That's okay. please, I'll ask. No, no. no, that's okay, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture on the explanation of the qualities of a real sadhu. Because it is so true that out of the causeless mercy, and they, they descend from the spiritual world with only one intention to get the conditioned souls back to Krishna. Ooh. Maharaj, and also, you know, um, it's not a question as such, but Generally, as you, uh, in this day and age, it's quite, it is so important uh, to understand the definition when we are preaching as well, because many people's faith are driven by material desires, um, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, in the divisions of faith chapter, because when, when you get something out of somebody, if, if somebody is materially struggling, and if they worship a Baba or some of the you know, some of these sort of so-called people with Siddhis, they find material progress, and then for them that is God. And 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 this is so important to have the clear distinctions while preaching as well. But at the same time, we got to maintain that, maintain a, a how shall we, a non-confrontational style, uh, because people get quite offensive uh, <laughs> when they are told the truth when what they believe is not not correct. And I was reading somewhere as well, just recently in the Guru Disciple book uh, about the qualities of a sadhu. And you know, one of the questions that is asked in the initiation ex exam uh, is, uh, why do we have to trust the words in the Guru? Uh, why do you want to follow his instructions life after life? And one of the one of the things which is that the, the Guru or, the, or a sadhu uh, has no other personal interest other than propagating the true message of Krishna. So it is so, so important to, to know these things and to keep reminding ourselves as well because to have that clear distinction. So thank you, Maharaj, for the, for the class. And uh, I think the uh, verse itself and the purport gives you the uh, understanding of what is a sadhu and what is not a sadhu and who to hear from and who to avoid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, we have to look for that. We may not be able to see it uh, on first contact, but one should be very uh, thoughtful in accepting someone who you accept as an authority, unless you know that they, ha they have the qualifications to become a real authority. A real authority means a representative of God. <laughs> God being the supreme authority and anyone who represents God is also an authority. <laughs> but if they represent their material desires, that's not authority. That's, their, that's the authority of their own mind. Thank you. Sudha. Um, yeah, Hare Krishna. Uh, Dhanat Pranam Guru Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, uh, for the wonderful class. Uh, so, um, <laughs> So Guru Maharaj, we have, I have a question about like uh, these um, saintly uh, qualities. I mean, uh, uh, hearing uh, the qualities, it's really um, helps me to understand like, you know, where, where and what I'm lacking. So, I mean, we were actually, me, I was uh, reading a similar um, like uh, verse uh, from Bhagavad Gita 8 to 12 with my uh, oldest son. And we had like uh, some uh, argument on this. Like, uh, so my question is like, you know, when you're actually trying to serve Krishna through pure um, devotion, so will we automatically develop these saintly qualities or like, uh, should we aim for these qualities? 
Well, they should go together, but it, you know, with, with reference to that verse from the, the 13th chapter, verses 8 through 12, Prabhupada gives uh, one of the... Yeah, Prabhupada gives one of those qualifications as being the foundation for, for all of them. Um, I would have to see the actual verse to, rem to uh, be able to point it out. But it comes, again, I think, in relationship to what is being said today, and that is uh, those engaged in devotional service. So devotional service, yeah. Unalloyed devotional service, yeah, is one of the characteristics mentioned in that verse. I think it's the, the 20 characteristics in the 19th one, I believe, is, um, yeah, from that verse. So in answer to your question, I my understanding is we need to cultivate these two aspects simultaneously. That means you engage in devotional service and at the same time, you cultivate the qualities of the mode of goodness, which are mentioned here. Now, to take that a little bit further is that when one becomes fixed in devotional service and is situated uh, on a platform with no material desires, then those characteristics and qualities automatically manifest through the activities of devotional service. But initially, as we approach the process of devotional service, we should be very aware of what we should avoid and what we, uh, yeah, what we should avoid and what we should accept. And what we should accept is, or what we should cultivate or focus on is these qualities here. So um, here, the 15th one is accepting the importance of self-realization. Prabhupada makes that point in his classes in reference to these, this particular set of verses here. Without that, these other qualities are more or less just the mode of goodness when accepting the importance of self-realization and that's applied in a day-to-day -day, you know, routine, then these qualities take on the quality of transcendence. And they aid one or they, they actually are expressions of devotional service in, the, in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand that there are different, the same thing is understood in two different ways, depending on the level of one's practice. For a neophyte, it's one way. For one who's on a higher platform, it's a little, it's different. And one who's on the highest platform, it is completely different. Although all of them are exhibiting good qualities. Some are cultivating them and some are expressing them naturally because they have developed them through the process of bhakti. Is that clear? Uh, yes, Maharaj. So um, as a neophyte, uh, we have to still practice those qualities, uh, focusing on Krishna. Yeah. Mm. You can't, you know, you can't do deity worship unless you are, you know, mm -hmm. practicing good high standards of cleanliness. You have to mm -hmm. do that. Or yeah. if you want to chant the holy names of the Lord effectively, you have to call, you have to be in a mood of humility mm -hmm. while chanting. Yes. Otherwise, the chanting won't develop beyond a certain level. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this process, um, it will help us to develop the saintly qualities. Yes, it's simultaneous. Mm -hmm. Simultaneous. And the goal is uh, to develop uh, the love of Godhead. 
That's the only goal here. Mm -hmm. There are intermediate goals that we have to establish in order to reach the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the intermediate goals, just like one of the intermediate goals will to uh, come to the platform of chanting offenselessly. So that's mm -hmm. a good, that's a goal that we can strive for. Let me develop my chanting above okay. offensiveness or offenselessly. Now that's an intermediate goal, which will help you to lead to the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. okay. so there, are many there are many intermediate goals that we can establish, but they're all in relationship to the highest goal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do we do what we're doing? Do we do it just because we do it? Or is it, do we understand the reason behind what we're doing and why it's important? Yeah, thank you, Mara. So we have to do it simultaneously. Um, ultimately, like uh, the goal is like love of Godhead. Yeah, frame of Pumartaman. There are five activities of the human being. We're called, they're called Purushartas. Purushartas. That means the activities of the human society. And that is Artha, Dharma, no, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Uh, pious activities, economic development, fulfilling one's essential needs and ultimately liberation. But then there's the fifth goal, which is called Prema Pumarta Mahan or, or Purusharta Siromani. That Purusharta, which is the crest jewel of all, and that is Prema Pumarta Mahan, love of God. Mm -hmm. So that is a real activity. That is the fulfillment of the human form of life to come to the stage of loving Krishna in all of our activities. Mm -hmm. It's not hard. We love, we love our children. We love our husband. We love somebody. We can love Krishna too. It's easy. And Krishna... Krishna is more lovable than anybody else we know because he has all the attractive qualities. Mm. Because he's he has he has all good qualities, he's naturally attractive, and therefore our love is attracted by his, you know, uh, transcendental qualities. And we might find some of the qualities more attractive than others, but all of them are attractive. Mm -hmm. We try, we try to love someone in this world, but we find that there's imperfection both in the person and in the loving relationship. But in Krishna, there's no imperfection either in the person or in the loving relationship. And Krishna is already loving us. So it's now our duty simply to reciprocate, that's all. It's easy. In principle, Maharaj, thank you, Maharaj. It really helps so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. thank you, Maharaj. Uh, devotees, is there anyone who would like to ask any question? Madan Gopal, are you asking questions today? Madan Gopal Prabhuji, do you have a question? Okay. 
Any Please accept my obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. Um, my question is, when you have a busy work schedule and you start early in the morning, you know, um, it's hard to chant japa sometimes after work um, because you're really tired or the mind or whatever. So this is a simple question. I just... Um, I just wanted some, you know, practical advice on how to, to really chant good japa after work, even if you're just really tired or not feeling good. Well, when it comes to japa, you have to schedule it. If you go by, you know, how you feel or don't feel, you'll find you won't be able to manage your japa. You have to schedule it. Try to get as much of your required grounds done before you begin your daily activities. That's that should be the focus. And then leave some time in a scheduled part of the rest of the day where you know you're not going to be tired, where you can uh, complete your chanting. Yes, thank you. Practical question. We have to look at our day and see what we're doing at what time we're doing it, what is required, what is optional, what is adjustable. Maybe to add to the question, um, I feel like the days are just going by and everything's kind of repetitive. And, um, you know, the material world definitely is a boring place, but how to keep that enthusiasm going when you feel like life is just repetitive and boring? Yeah, well, you're, it sounds like uh, you're in a, what they use to use a very, uh, glib word or ordinary word you've fallen into a bad pattern or we might use the word rut we fall into a rut in other words we're, we're stuck into a pattern that is not very productive and that we accept that as the only way to live and that that acceptance is is a form of defeating any opportunities for change so you have to see how to get out of that pattern, adjust the pattern to make it more uh, productive, both on the spiritual, especially on the spiritual platform. Uh, devotional service is not boring. <laughs> if, it's, if it's boring, then we're seeing it in the material way. It's not boring. Even if we do the most menial activities, if it's done for Krishna and devotional service, or it's done to follow the instructions of the spiritual master, it's, um, it's enlivening. We're offering something of value. But material life yeah, is boring because there's no real juice to it it's it's just there's no happiness in material life it's just struggle that's all it is struggle to stay in the struggle doesn't mean you're happy <laughs> those who struggle continuously they're never happy even if they somehow successfully struggle through the day and be able to complete all their required duties that doesn't mean they've gained any happiness or satisfaction, or progress. So my my uh, comments are not about getting rid of your responsibilities in the material sense, but it's learning how to spiritualize your life, where these these material activities don't become, you know, a drudgery. <laughs> Uh, 
and good sadhana, devotee association, reading and understanding and discussing the books gives us life, gives us satisfaction, awakens the, the pleasure principle. Yes, Guruj. Uh, fortunately, I have my good wife to associate with. That's pretty much it for the last year. And uh, yeah, it's just um, I just feel uh, like I'm trapped in this little apartment, and I'm looking at the same walls every day. And so I'm well, done I, I looking at a, this. Yeah. <laughs> I have, uh, I have a plan for you. I'll discuss it with you privately. <laughs> okay. So you can look forward to something different. Hare Krishna. So I don't want to speak about it until it's actually formulated, but but I'll uh, I'll con connect with you and and present it to you. Much appreciated. Okay, okay Hare Krishna. I had a plan for Sri Devi too, but we're not sure she's going to take it or not. <laughs> Guru Maharaj, I am taking it. I'm taking the steps to do it, Guru Maharaj. You better put on bigger shoes then. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hello, Namrata. Hare Krishna. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All, all glories to Shri Prabhupada. Sometimes Maharaj, uh, while chanting, uh, sometimes during my rounds, I'm uh, quite absorbed in the you know, sound of Krishna and in the sound vibration. But sometimes it really... At that time, when I'm absorbed, it, it, it is easier to chant. And uh, it is not a struggle. But uh, sometimes it happens that the mind is like wandering. And it, I, I'm like literally uh, pulling my thoughts back. Oh, they're just going away. I'm pulling them back. So uh, at that time, it feels a struggle uh, while I'm chanting. So how to have the uh, you know the neutralized state well don't uh, don't avoid the struggle sometimes the struggle is due to you know your consciousness is in, in a different place that day or it might be the increase of the modes of material nature which causes us to struggle more or less but uh, don't give up the struggle because the effort you make in devotional service is devotional service also if you're trying to chant your rounds, even though you might find yourself struggling as opposed to not struggling, it's both devotional service because you're, you're offering your best and that's, that's bhakti. Krishna's, Krishna may, it seems like he's more interested in the results, but he's not. He's interested mostly in our determination to stay fixed in devotional service. And we'll find there will be ups and downs. That is the way of the material. The ups and downs come in our own consciousness. It comes from the material energy. Like that. But in any case, don't give up. Okay, Maharaj. So the, the thing is, we should, uh, if it is happening, if, if, if the thoughts are running out of your hand, then is it fine to just, you know, watch it, whatever is going on in your mind, or, you know, keep struggling or, you know, pull it back? and You can watch it to, to maybe to understand it, but if you watch it too long, you're missing the whole point. You, you should be chanting instead of watching. <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah, watch it to see, oh, this is what's happening and what it was, what's causing it. Like sometimes we're a little tired, more tired when you get up. So when you're a little more tired and it's more of a struggle to hear nicely. So then again, you might see, oh, this is happening because I'm a little more tired. So then you adjust. You adjust by either walking around or increasing the, the speed of your japa. So you, it makes up for the mind wandering more when you're tired. And, you know, you have to see. But evaluation is not the process. It's simply a way to adjust our or to understand, and then you go on with the process itself, which is chanting. Okay, my God. Yeah. Don't get discouraged. These things happen to everyone. Sometimes it's easy, and sometimes it's a little more difficult. Yes, Maharaj. I, I, I only tend to, you know, in, uh, I mean, increase my rounds. Um, I'm not, uh, I, even if my struggle is going on, I don't uh, try to decrease my rounds. So I, I let it happen, but I don't decrease my rounds. Yeah, that's the idea. Okay, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. There are many books we could read about chanting, techniques for improving chanting. Sachinanda Maharaj has written many, two or three books on chanting, major books. Shiva Ram Maharaj has written, written some smaller books. Um, there's another one by one former sannyasi in our movement, uh, Mahanidhi Swami. He wrote a beautiful book on chanting Japa also. So there's many, um, many good books that you can get tech understandings from which will help you to have, develop the, the proper mindset when you approach the Holy Name. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, these days I'm referring to Sachin and then Maharaj. He has a he has a kind of meditative uh, method of uh, chanting. So uh, I, I refer his videos for that chanting and all. So um, I haven't uh, yet uh, gone through the Shivram Maharaj. Uh, so I'll I'll try to go through that. Yeah, there's one is there's one book he wrote called Chant More. That's uh, by Shiva Ram Maharaj. Small little book, but it's a series of uh, articles about chanting. It's called Chant More. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Maharaj. And then there's one by um, I. I think Mahanidhi Swami, it's called the Nectar of the Holy Name. I think that's the name of it. Mahanidhi. Yeah, Mahanidhi Swami. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. He's no longer a member of our organization, but when he was, he was writing, he wrote that book about chanting the holy name. I'm not sure the exact title of it, but it was, it's a pretty good book, uh, very good in fact. That is oceans of material available. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Krishna. What is? Yes. Shall we conclude here? 
if uh, no one has any questions, comments, or realizations, then Sri Devi Mataji has a question. Yeah, if you don't mind, please. Go ahead. Uh, dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada Guru Maharaj. Um, I have a question about the tolerance, the compassion of the sadhus. Of course, they are on a very, very exalted level, and so they can display this tolerance, mercifulness. But on our level, should we be very discriminatory uh, about our association? For example, if we see that some devotees are not really in good consciousness or they're not following the instructions properly, should we avoid association with, with uh, devotees who are somewhat uh, wavering maybe in their Krishna consciousness because it will affect us? Oh, that's, that's also there. Yeah. You, they say you, if someone is not behaving properly or their character is not good, then you can respect them from a distance, but you don't want to associate with them. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're just in general Maya, then maybe you can help them. But if they're acting wrongly and not taking any advice, then you want to avoid that. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. So if uh, no one else has any question, comments, realizations, then with your permission, Maharaj, shall we end the call here? Yes, thank you very much. All glories to the assembled devotees. Thank you, Maharaj, for your time and association. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you, devotees. Hare Krishna.